Safety, number two, courtesy, number three, show, and number four, efficiency. Uh, that is in the correct order, and you're going to want to remember that because there's a quiz later. <laughs> so it's safety, courtesy, show, and efficiency. Now, can anyone give me an example of safety in the Magic Kingdom? Ropes. Security. Ropes. Right. Security. Uh, the chains that keep you in specific areas. Those are very, very, very good examples. And those are all because we want to make sure that you stay as safe as possible. So with security, you're going to go through those security checks to make sure that nobody's bringing anything into the park that we that nobody needs to into the park. Also with the chains, they're there to help you stay in an organized and fashionably manner so that nothing, no one gets tripped or hurt or anything like that. Though I will tell you, when I work out at our window location, there are chains. If you've ever take, taken a look when you're coming into the park to the right, uh, there are chains that kind of represent the queue line for it. And there are little kids who love to swing on those chains. And as many times as we tell them, do not swing on those chains, they never listen. And there's always one that thinks he can jump it. His foot hits, bam. So it's kind of one of those where some days you're just like, oh man, okay, come on, it's okay, it's okay, you're fine. And there are some days where you're like, I told you four times not to do that, and you did it, so look what happened. So, and sometimes it is those moments where you're just like, <laughs> um, but another thing that we have for safety is if you take a look at our curves, you're going to notice it goes from red to black and then to the cobblestone down here. We are letting you know that everything is changing, the leveling is changing, so you're going to want to pay attention. And that's mainly for people like me, who I don't pay attention to anything below my knees. So I trip, I hit trash cans, things like that. So this is really nice when you see that because you go, okay, something's changing, I need to pay attention. We also have our wheelchair ramps to help you get up onto the sidewalks for our strollers as well as our guests with uh, wheelchairs because as you can tell with Main Street, it's really busy. There's lots of stuff going on. We normally have vehicles that are coming up and down the street as well as the trolley coming up and down the street. So that's a lot to take in at once and we want to make sure that everything is, everybody is able to get to a safe place if those vehicles are moving. Now another thing we have is if you take a look above this green building right here, you're going to see the green post and then you're also going to see a metal post right behind it. And that is a lightning rod. We here in Central Florida are one of the lightning strike capitals of the United States. So we get a lot of lightning a year. So if you take a look at all of the flagpoles up and down Main Street, those all also serve as lightning rods. You're going to start to notice above all of the buildings as we pass them, you're going to see little bitty lightning rods. And that's because we want to make sure that if lightning were to hit, it's going to hit the right place and not somewhere where we don't want it to hit. Um, now, also for safety, we have our doors open on Main Street in USA to all of our stores. And that's because how many of you have just had one of those days where you just need retail therapy? And when you go have retail therapy, you come home and you have your arms full of bags. And you're like, you know what, I'm going to get this in one trip. I do not want to come back to my car, so we're just going to do this. So you load up, you have your keys in one hand, you manage to lock your door, to the, lock your car, and you get to your front door and you're like, okay, I've got to get this key in here somehow. So you manage to get the key in, then you like elbow the door open, and then do the kick move. Does everybody know the kick move? Yeah. Well, we don't want you to have to do the kick move here. So we have our doors open. It also makes it easier for our guests with strollers and wheelchairs to get in and out of our stores. Because how many of you have ever been pushing a stroller or a wheelchair and you have to do this? Pull it open and then shove it in. And we want to make sure that you don't have to strain yourself or pull anything that you're not supposed to pull. Because a lot of our doors are pretty heavy. Now, that particular thing also goes as a courtesy because with our doors open, it's a lot easier to get in and out, right? So that's definitely a courtesy that we have here as well in the Magic Kingdom. Now, can anyone think of another courtesy that we have? I might have one on right now. On this portion. Name tag. Name tag. Correct. How many of you have ever been shopping in a store and nobody in the store is wearing a name tag? And you are like, I don't want to ask a question because I'm going to walk up to that one person and go, hey, do you have this? I don't work here. <laughs> That's not fun, right? Yeah. So it's a lot easier for us as cast members to wear these name tags because we're more approachable when we do wear them. So it's more of a courtesy as well as having where we're from because that way people are more comfortable coming up to you. Sometimes they see where you're from and they're like, oh my gosh, we're from right down the road. Where did you go to school? Where did you go to school? Da -da -da -da. And you have these huge conversations. So it's something that's really nice that we have. It's also very easy for parents to look at their children and say, okay, 
if you get separated from me, look for someone with this name tag. And so that also ties in with our safety as well, because we do, each of us as cast members are trained on what to do if a lost child is approached, does find us, or we find our way to that lost child. And by the way, there's never a lost child, it's always a lost parent. <laughs> so, um, but we also have the, we also have wristbands in City Hall where parents can come get them and put their names on them, so it's a lot easier for us to help find them. Um, now, uh, another courtesy that we have is we're all out and about during the day. So it's pretty easy normally to find a cast member. Sometimes we're standing outside waving to you. Sometimes we're standing inside waving to you because it's hot outside. But it's always something that we're there for. We really do like to be there for our guests. Now, show. You would think that that's probably the most important thing that we have here, right? I mean, it's clean all the time. The costumes match Main Street USA. Main Street USA looks phenomenal. Like, I mean, you just kind of think about it. And as soon as you enter into a Disney park, you always know you're there. And if you think about it also, you've never seen a television inside any Disney park, right? And believe me, on game days, Saturdays, and Sundays, it's really difficult. <laughs> but it's because when you come into our theme parks, we want you to forget about the real world and come into your fantasy world. So with Main Street USA, it is designed loosely on Marsley, Missouri, around the turn of the century, so 1901. Now, Walt was born in 1901 in Chicago, Illinois, and soon moved to Marsling, Missouri afterwards, where, where his father was a contractor. And with that, he thinks of Marsling, Missouri as that place where he just had the best time of his life. It was that perfect moment as kids where you don't think about safety. You are not concerned with what's going on around you. It's safe to walk up and down the street to go to the grocery store by yourself, things like that. And he wanted to represent that here as well. So when you come into our park, you're taken back to being that five-year-old child again inside. And so with that, if you take a look around, the colors were also all very 1901 turn of the century. It's very light, very pastel colors. And that's because at that time, it was a very hopeful time for our country. Because we were going from horse-drawn buggies to electric vehicles, or to cars. We were going from kerosene lanterns to electric light. Things were changing. Everything was turning, picking up for us. Now, also part of the show is what's going on right now. If you take a listen. They're taking dance lessons up here. Now, this is something that happens every single day. It goes, it's on a rotation. Now, if you've never been here before, it's kind of something you wouldn't think about. So when they're sitting here, you can hear that. It makes you think that there's actually someone that they're taking those lessons, right? That is something that's going on. So again, you're put into that position of thinking, hey, this is truly Main Street USA. This is not something that's Now, when you go from Main Street USA, and you even have the costumes that look Main Street USA, long skirts and the short and the short six shirts, it definitely wouldn't fit in Tomorrowland, right? Well, from there you go into Adventureland, where you go from these beautiful, hopeful colors to very earth tone colors. So you've got your um, browns, your oranges, your greens. So, and then also when you're walking to Adventureland, all there is is that sign that says Adventureland. There's nothing else that gives away what's inside. And that's because it's a complete mystery to us what you are going to create and what you're going to find in there. And that's because it is an Adventureland. It's not there for us to tell you, hey, you're going to go on this specific adventure. We want you to find that out for yourself. So you're going from the very rustic, uh, and those costumes in that area also are the same way. Those very earth tones. Think about the jungle birds. Those skipper outfits are something you would see on a safari to help you blend in with your environment. Then you go from Adventureland right into Frontierland, where it's still rustic, but they finally found an area that they think are, they're able to live in. So they're starting to colonize. They're starting to settle there. So you still have those major earth tones, but you also have the um, blues and the reds that are starting to come in there as well. And then from there you go right into Liberty Square, which is red, white, and blue all the way. John Philip Sousa is always playing when you walk through there. And the costumes are very representative of the 13 original colonies. So from there, you go into Fantasyland, where it's a world of pinks and blues and yellows and greens. And all of the attractions are very fantasy-like. I mean, Peter Pan, you're flying in a pirate ship. Hello, how cool is that? And then it's a small world, the carousel. It's all things that just kind of 
take you either to that place when you were younger reading these fairy tales or just an adventure. It's also just kind of fun when you go in there. And then from there you go right into Tomorrowland where it's a world of tomorrow. You've got your silvers, your blacks, your teals, your purples. All those colors that are very futuristic. And those costumes that match. They're very sharp lines. Everything is very futuristic when you go in there. So you know exactly what you're getting into. Now, all of that has to do with our major show. But one thing that also ties in with the show is these doors being open on Main Street USA. And that's because in 1901, when a store was open for business, the doors would be open. When they were closed, it meant the store was closed for the day. So it's kind of funny how we take safety and courtesy as well as show, and it all fits in together and works together as a team. Now, efficiency is our last thing. And we have a lot of things that are set up to make everything as efficient as possible for our guests. But one thing that nobody ever thinks of is our utilidor. The utilidor, of course, lovingly known as the tunnel, is all set up for the efficiency of cast members. And that's because when Walt opened Disneyland, he realized that he had cast members working in Frontierland that were walking through Tomorrowland, which of course messed with the number three P, show. Because does it make sense to have someone in a cowboy hat walking in Tomorrowland? Absolutely not. There were no space cowboys at that time. <laughs> so, he decided that here he wanted to create the utilidor where we as customers can get to and from our work locations as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And instead of being out on stage having to dodge our guests as well as other cast members with their bags and things like that, we're just down in the utilidor. So, we pop up where we need to and we go to work. As well as we store things down there that you would never think about when you're on stage. Package pickup. If you've ever, has anyone ever used package pickup where you send things to the front of the park? How they get around is the utility. So that's why you never see them throughout the park just hauling bags. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, but that's one of the ways that we as cast members do things. And it's set up to help us get things done as quickly as possible for you as our guests. Now, anyone have any questions about our four keys to the kingdom? I have a question about that one. Yeah. What is actually going on in here? Is it offices or receptive rooms? is because Walt was the dreamer, but Roy was the doer behind him. So we like to pay a little homage to him right there. Now does anyone have any questions or are we ready to check out some more windows? Alright, here we go. Now does anyone know who Elias Disney is? Walt's father! Ding, 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 ding! We have a winner. Uh, now, did Walt's father have anything to do with the creation of the Disney company? Hard Walker was a very close friend with Walt and Roy. And when Walt and Roy went into business together, what happens when brothers go into business together? They're going to fight. They're not going to agree. Well, Card Walker was the one person out of all of their friends that went into business with them that said, Walt, you're in one corner. Roy, you're in the other corner. Uh, now, Walt, of course, did not actually go to the designer. He was the designer and master planner of everything in detail and takes it to a whole other level. Because all aspects of, has everyone seen this West Family Robinson? Okay, so it's the shipwreck. Well, all four, uh, all portions of that ship are being used. The hull is covered in the front of the ship. You have the mast that's telling you it's there. Then when you're walking into the attraction, you're going to see the oars that are standing up that are holding the sail, which is giving you shade. And then the rails are the rails from when you were on, on the deck of the ship. If you were to hit rough water, you would grab a hold of that to keep yourself steady. Now also, of course, inside the treehouse, it looks just like this was in the treehouse, which that was one of my favorite things when I was growing up. I loved that movie. So I would come in, come in here and try to climb into the hammocks, and my mother literally had to drag me kicking and screaming to get out of there. But you also have the bleachers that are outside that have portions of the ship that are there to keep the plants in them. Then as you go, you're going to see the cannons that are lined up up front. And there's a set of benches that are on the other side of that lantern that are made out of rock. And if you look to the far left side of that, well, if you're looking at it from here, it's the far right, but if you're sitting on it, far left, there's actually a chisel that was used to help carve out those seats. So it's just kind of interesting that they have, they paid that much attention to detail. 
detail and put those things there to make you feel like someone who literally just created them. But how are we able to do that? How are we able to bring all of these attention to details to life? Well, it all started with a mouse, right? Or did it? Does anyone know the very first character that Walt created that was very popular? The rabbit. Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, that is correct. Now, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit was created while Walt was under contract from a different company. And when Walt was going for his yearly check-in with them, contract renewal, seeing what they expected of him, all of that good stuff, he found out that Oswald was staying under contract, but he was not. So, um, with that, when he was on the train heading home, he and his wife, Lillian, were kind of figuring out, okay, well, what's our next move? What are we going to do now? And one thing Walt was very, very good at was he doodled a lot. When he was in World War One, he doodled all over his ambulances, things like that. It just kind of helped him in his mind. And he was doodling on the train and created a mouse. And he looked at Lillian and he went, I have done it. I have created the next best thing. Meet Mortimer Mouse. And Lillian went, Mortimer? I don't think that's necessarily the best name. So they started brainstorming about names and came up with Mickey Mouse. And that was the birth of Mickey Mouse. Now, there is a Mortimer Mouse. Well, we did get that. He was one from the very early cartoons, and he's more of a rat than a mouse. He's not very nice. Um, and so for me, though, Walt did not expect Mickey to take off as much as he did. Mickey became a huge success. And so Walt started getting more and more ideas of what can I do, what can make this better. And he decided he wanted to create a full-length 90-minute animated feature film. And people at the time were like, you've got to be crazy. The only time people watch cartoons now is as a short before the movie that they're actually coming to watch. And Walt went, you know what, I think you're wrong. So he spent a little over a million dollars creating this film. And at the time of its release, which was 1937, movie tickets for adults were 25 cents. For children, they were 15 cents. And this movie made over $8 million. And that is Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, your favorite. Um, so with that, Snow White then opened more doors for Walt, going, what else can I do that is just going to put it over the top? Because that was something that Walt always wanted to do. He wanted to go above and beyond. And so he decided he wanted to create a fully uh, immersive experience for his guests. So not only something that's stimulated to the eyes, it's stimulated to all the other senses. So he created this film. And he created what was called Fanta Sound to go with it. So it was just like surround sound now and what movie theater does and have surround sound. But he also wanted ushers to walk up and down the aisle with potpourri if flowers were on the screen, with water, if water was on the screen to splash you. So it just kind of made it that it's basically like Mickey's Film Our Magic now. Um, but at the time of its release, only 13 theaters were able to accommodate Walt with what he wanted to do. So Walt called this film an honest mistake. It was released in 1940, and the film was Fantasia, which is now one of our most critically acclaimed films. And so with that, Walt had to go back to the drawing board, because he still wanted to create a fully immersive experience for his guests. And so what did he do? He decided to create Disneyland. And so Disneyland, of course, he had television for a series that told you exactly what he was going to do, where he was going to build. But with that TV series, everyone was so excited about it because it was the first of its kind. And so when it opened, the tickets that Walt had given out were counterfeited. And then people who lived in that area were taking their own ladders from home and leaning them up against the wall of Disneyland saying, $5 and we can go to Disneyland. And so with that, and it being the first theme park that we were ever building, we of course had to do the what do we have to have versus what do we want to have. So we had to have restrooms so we didn't have water fountains. We had to have concrete, but we literally laid it at the very last minute possible. So, Disneyland opened July 17, 1955. Now, when women were walking into the parks, women at the time were not wearing tennis shoes, they did not wear flats, they wore heels most of the time. And so when they were walking on this concrete that was still drying, their feet were sinking. So in parts of Disneyland today on Main Street, you'll actually still see heel prints from people who were coming into the park at that time. Now, that park actually ran out of food, they ran out of water, and there was a television station there filming the whole thing. Ah, that's absolutely amazing, right? Well, the TV station was actually ABC, 
which is now part of the Disney family. It became part of the Disney family in the, in the mid 90s. And one thing that Walt really credited them with was they chose not to talk about all the negatives. They talked about the fact that this was the first of its kind. This was somewhere where all of his guests, adults and children alike, could come in and have a good time. They weren't focused on, oh, this is just for the kids. And then, oh no, this is just for the adults. This was the first time adults and kids were having a good time together, not focusing on one or the other. So with that, and the success of that, Walt hey, yeah. then created, or had the idea for, another theme park, which brought him here to Florida. Now, y'all have been such an amazing group. I think it's time for your first reward. The first attraction of the day! Alright, well, can anyone guess what attraction we're going to be riding? Because we are an adventure. Close, but... Do I start with a J? Jungle Cruise! for an attraction at a theme park. But the original idea had us using live animals. Now, of course, Roy being the producer was like, okay, well, with that, where are the animals gonna live? What are we gonna feed them? And when we're operating this theme park, they're gonna wanna be sleeping. So they settled for the Jungle Cruise that we know and love today. Now, with that though, when it originally opened in California, I'm going to talk to you through this so we don't let everyone on the dock know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, but when that happened in California, um, it was supposed to be, it was more like the True Life Adventure series that it created. So everything was telling you about the animals, their history, their heritage, things like that, instead of making the funny jokes that everybody knows and loves. Well, Walt actually got onto one of the cruises at that time and realized that the skipper was kind of poking fun at the attraction because Okay, it's kind of corny when you ride it, but it's fantastic. And he realized, you know what, this is great. I like this, so why not have that happen here? Um, so that's how we got the Jungle Cruise we know and love today. Now, has anyone ever wondered how many different types of plants there are in the Jungle Cruise? There are a lot. And, um, but we do have 600 horticulture specialists throughout all four of our theme parks that take, um, that rotate in and out of taking care of these plants. Now all of these are tropical plants, and it's a very hard job because some of them have to look alive and some of them have to look dead. But since they are tropical, when it gets cold here in Florida, we have to take care of them somehow. So we have heaters that take care of them for us. And on the other side of this bamboo, you're going to see a little box that has green army stuff on it, and that is one of the heaters. They're all back in that area. Now, do I have any hidden Mickey people on the boat? Yes. Okay, well, we're going to find some hidden Mickeys today. Get excited. Uh, now, the first of them being right up here on these boats. Now, if you take a look at the front or the heads of the canoes, you might recognize the famous mouse, the famous duck, and a famous dog. So, famous mouse, duck, and dog. And there is one group that we have to thank for how beautiful they are, and that is our artist prep department. Now, our artist prep department, their main concern is making sure that everything is show ready for us. So, they come in and paint things or redo them if need be. And that does include this fantastic gorilla over here that's trying on a hat. When this attraction opened in 1971, he had a red back. But when we were doing our research for the Animal Kingdom, we realized that a gorilla of that size and that age should have a silver back. So our artist prep department came in and took care of that for us. Now, also, all of the animals in this attraction have a twin. And that's so if one of them needs maintenance, because most of them are made out of rubber, they're able to replace it with the twin to take that one out so it does not affect the efficiency of this attraction. Now, speaking of animals, we're coming up on some fantastic elephants. Now, they might look like audio animatronics, right? Well, they're actually run on air pressure. And that's because we didn't want the oils from these animals to leak into the water system. Because this water actually makes its way all the way to Seven Seas Lagoon out in front of the Magic Kingdom and back here. And speaking of water, take a look at it. It's beautiful, right? We all want to go swimming? Well, it's dyed, guys. Yay! And that's because, as an amazing skipper as Brian is, he is only controlling the forward-backward motion of the boat, as well as the speed. 
And that's because this attraction is built on a trough system. So there's a pylon right here, as well as under the engine, that has two wheels that take us through the track. Now, coming up, we have a fantastic group of men that's stuck on a pole because of a rhino. Well, if you take a look at the limb man on the totem pole, you might recognize his face because he is also uh, the caretaker for the graveyard scene in the Haunted Mansion. Now, how do we dye this water? How does it stay dyed? I don't really understand. Well, we put the dye in back behind the waterfall that's about to come into play. And with that waterfall moving as well as the boats moving, it keeps that dye moving so you never see the trough system. in between the two windows and above the rock, in between the two windows and above the rock, I'm going to say it again, in between the two windows and above the rock, you're going to see three circles put together that make a Mickey. So right up here, in between the two windows and right above that rock, three circles put together that make Mickey. Has anyone seen that one before? No. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, now as we're, as we're rounding the corner, we're coming into the hippo scene, the famous one. Now you can hear the air pressure to let you know that this, these are not audio animatronics. But what's really cool about these hippos is they're actually hippo bottomless because we do not build what you cannot see. So have no fear they're not actually going to charge the boat. Now, also as we're rounding the corner, we like to do hidden sound bites in some of our attractions. And one of them happens to be in this one. The natives that are going to be on my side of the boat over here, one of them says yaka laka laka, one of them goes up la la la, and the other one says I love disco because this was created in the height of disco. <laughs> so wait for it, wait for it. We go through the Nile, the Congo, the Amazon, and now the Mekong, but not necessarily in that order. But if you take a look at the architecture, it might look familiar. And that's because it's the same architecture that you're going to see in Animal Kingdom in Asia. Because like I mentioned before, if we're able to reuse things, we love to reuse them. And if we can hit the lights, we serve. Thank you. Now, in here, you're going to notice that little attention to detail that I've mentioned. And that's because the Imagineers, when they create an attraction for us, we want to make sure that it is down to perfection. So if we do have a guest that's actually been to a forgotten temple in the Meekle River Valley, it looks just like that. Now, we're also going to be coming up on some snakes that might look familiar because they are the same snakes that you will see in the Indiana Jones room in the great movie ride at Hollywood Studios. that's not going to actually grow on them in the wild, so we have to be careful about that. 
Now, Brian, have you gotten wet here before? All right. Now, it's kind of a rite of passage for our skippers to get wet um, at least once because the, uh, the, enge the engineers that work this attraction love to play jokes on them. Especially on April Fools, they'll, uh, they'll change up the, the, what would you call it? The squirt. Squirting order. Yeah. Squirting order. And so um, when, when that happens, either a whole boat gets wet or just the skipper gets wet or just the people get wet. So, um, now also we have coming up here is Trader Sam. If you take a look at his tunic, that's a little bit of the old Jungle Cruise mixed with the new Jungle Cruise because that tunic is made out of the same fabric that used to be covering our Jungle Cruise boats when we opened in the 70s. Now, does anyone have any questions about the Jungle Cruise that Brian or I can answer for you? Brian, we did our job. I have one. Yes, ma'am. Who came up with all the corny jokes in the first place? That one just kind of changed over time. People find new jokes. It's like one of the ones that's really popular right now for the Jungle Cruise is, why is Cinderella such a terrible soccer player? Because she runs from the ball and she has a pumpkin for a coach. <laughs> My personal favorite one that I always use, and it's perfect for right now because we've made it back to the dock, is... Why is the Jungle Cruise skipper called a skipper and not a captain? Because the captains go down with the ship and the skippers skip right on out. So it's a good thing we have made it back, otherwise we'd be swimming. Now, um, another one that's really popular is, well, this one's really popular in the laugh floor and I've heard it a couple of times here, but how do you wake up Lady Gaga? You p -p -p poker face. <laughs> Um, and then, how does Lady Gaga like her meat cooked? Raw, 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 raw. <laughs> Yay! Brian, what's your favorite joke to tell? Uh, they're all good. So, but it's just kind of, they come up with it over time. It's kind of like when you're testing out new material for anything. If people laugh at it, you're like, okay, well this could probably work, so you're going to bring it in. So just over time is when those jokes developed. But you're welcome. Those are the corny jokes for the tour. Yay! Yay!